Hey there, and welcome to the Windsor Star News Cafe. I'm Dylan Christie. And I'm Don MacArthur. All right, well, big night in Sandwich last night. About 60 people turned out at Mackenzie Hall to discuss a $10 million lawsuit against the Ambassador Bridge Company. Well, exactly, and the kicker is that one of those 60 people was Dan Stamper, uh, yeah. the president. Front and uh, center. Front and center, side, the front row. Uh, that takes a chutzpah. Oh, yeah, uh, there's some stones on that guy. Yeah, there, <laughs> yes, definitely there is, Dylan. <laughs> but Dan Stamper, president of the Bridge Company, shows up at a meeting of Indian Road residents yep. who are suing the Bridge Company uh, for $10 million. He showed up there with no shame, a smile on his face and business cards, uh, handing them out uh, to the people uh, willing to, uh, to talk with them because his position, of course, is that the Bridge Company isn't to blame here for all these boarded up homes on Indian Road, Rosedale and Edison uh, in the city's west side, but that the city is to blame because they have prevented the Ambassador Bridge from demolishing uh, those homes. Quite yeah, a beauty. Well, that's it exactly. Uh, of course, they would like to tear down the homes, but they are, it's pretty obvious that they have full intent on building a second span. So a lot of people are saying that this is the city's attempt in order to prevent that from actually going forward, among with uh, other levels of government as well. Uh, but yeah, he, he sat front and center. Uh, Strasbourg actually said... Great pictures, great pictures uh, by Nick Brancaccio. Uh, really, he, he had it all. He had oh, a picture yeah. with Strasbourg, with Stamper, like a, you know, like a fox in the hen house. You know, just sort of, well, uh, Strasbourg uh, singled him out, saying that you've turned this area into a slum. Uh, you have the nerve to sit here. You can stay, but you cannot speak. Uh, he did speak to residents after. Um, he handed out his business card and uh, talked to them. But yeah, it was pretty amazing. Like you said, the photos really s tell the whole story. Yeah, I mean, Stamper, for his part, he's accusing the city of using the community uh, as pawns yeah. uh, in, in a fight with the bridge. And we have a clip uh, of Dan Stamper. Uh, Nick shot a little video. That's right. Uh, we're we're going to roll that for you now. Uh, Dan Stamper, Bridge Company, in his own words. Well, I think the uh, comments we heard was a mixed bag tonight. Uh, a lot of the folks understand the city's at fault for some of this, if not all of it. And, uh, and I think that this will sort itself out. Uh, I got a chance to talk to a lot of the community members before we left, gave them my card and told them to call me if you had any questions. And regarding the lawsuit that's launched against uh, the company? Well, I think the lawsuit, and as you heard tonight from the lawyers, uh, that we've done everything wrong, but there's no violations on any of those homes. There's no outstanding tickets or violations or or demands from the city to do anything. They meet all the current law as far as we know and as far as the city has told us. So uh, you can tell me about all the things I've done wrong, but I think those uh, homes as we keep them up and the security we have meets all the current regulations. And the so-called um, nuisance um, factor? Well, I think the nuisance, uh, you know, the city has to share that responsibility. They passed uh, specific new ordinances trying to keep the houses up and they're using these communities pawns in a fight with me you know the mayor's made it clear that if i will agree not to build a, a new span he would agree to let the houses come down that's using the community as pawns okay i uh, know that was dan stamper now it, it needs to be pointed out i mean he's it makes a very compelling case but uh, it's been made in court and a judge has disagreed with them um, City solicitor George Wilkie, uh, in a recent story Battagello uh, did on this, uh, he, he said, look, this is, this is old news, what, what the bridge is saying, and a court of law, uh, Superior Court Justice Richard Gates, uh, ruled that the city's actions to block demolition uh, of those homes on Indian Road, it was not conspiratorial in any way, it was just good governments uh, and, and sort of good development, so he, he just accused uh, the bridge uh, of sort of just their old tricks. I don't know, it's tough if you live on Indian Road. I mean, what Strasbourg is saying is that the bridge company, by buying these homes and not keeping them uh, in a positive no. state of repair, like if you and I owned a house, we have to cut the grass, we have to keep it clean, you know, we have to shovel the driveway, and if you would let it fall into a state of disrepair, yep. you have created a nuisance, and that's a legal term. Uh, you've created a nuisance for your neighbors, which has caused their properties to plummet. That, of course, is the basis of this $10 million lawsuit. Yeah, and Claire Brownell, she did a phenomenal job last night. She talked to a lot of residents who own homes in that area. Uh, it's a popular student housing area, and people are saying it's difficult to even rent out some of those homes uh, because of the neighboring areas. I know just since the time I've worked here, you, I, there's a lot of fires that you respond to out there, yeah, people in these uh, vacant homes, which is dangerous for firefighters too because you don't know what you're walking into, the condition of the homes. So it's definitely an issue that's been around for well, about a decade. Well, it's interesting too. I mean, people, they accuse the bridge of blockbusting, right? That's, no. that's what people say. And uh, But the bridge, they actually run security uh, in the neighborhood. Yeah. Anytime uh, our photographers go out to get uh, pictures of these boarded up homes on Indian Road, within a couple of minutes, boom, a uh, security guard comes up in a car to say, oh, hey, yeah. uh, what are you doing here? Even though it's sort of a public street, yeah. the bridge sort of holds some sway over there. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, man, Ward 7. Yeah, uh, this thing <laughs> the just story gets, keeps uh, going. The story keeps going. The story, uh, you know, keeps on giving. Uh, more questions and not many answers uh, in Dawson Chen's uh, front page story today. The city, they're literally going back to the drawing board to try to figure out how they can uh, come up with the process uh, for appointing someone. They're actually reading minutes from a meeting back in 1984. Yeah, no, he had a really comprehensive, I guess this did happen. Was that the last time it happened? Yeah, it was in 1984? Ago, 1984, they, uh, they appointed someone. They're going back, reading minutes from that meeting right. to figure out how they did it back then. Well, I think Valerie Critchley, the city clerk, kind of summed it up best. She says that we don't have a process or procedure in place for appointment to council. So they're going back, looking at old minutes from previous Windsor City Councils. Like we said yesterday, they are looking at Toronto City Council, who's going through the exact same thing right now. Uh, so really, they're just kind of throwing darts at a board and seeing what sticks. <laughs> it's been uh, interesting that a lot of people have come forward already just in our comment section online saying that they're interested in applying uh, if they're able to. And uh, if you want to look at non-traditional routes, uh, someone has actually posted a Kijiji ad uh, trying to sell the Ward 7 seat uh, with only two stipulations. Uh, you have to show up Monday nights and always vote yes. And you can't uh, have come in second uh, for the general election for that ward. Which, of course, Angelo Marignani uh, of Melk, uh, lives in ward, which is downtown business, and he lives in Ward 7. He was number two, and, and they right. sort of flat out rejected him. Uh, Dave Battagello is, spoke with him today to see what yep. uh, he thinks about all of that. So check back later. Uh, for the full story. Now that Kijiji ad, um, uh, there's a quote, uh, we at the city feel, why waste time with silly elections when we can just pick someone? Um, and, you know, I guess it's had 124 visits uh, so far. That's at about noon uh, on uh, Wednesday. 124 people have been there. And uh, AIM 800, hey, props to them. They actually phoned Halberstadt. You know, he's always quick with a quote. Yep. And uh, here's what he said. It is comical. There is no doubt that council, with its actions or lack of actions, has become the laughing stock of the city. And well, it is funny, it is not funny. So that's what, that's what Halberstadt <laughs> thinks about uh, that Kijiji ad. So uh, I don't know. Um, my favorite quote is from Lloyd Brown, John, yeah. uh, retired professor over at the University of Windsor. Quote not on today. Kijiji. Yeah, but on... <laughs> not on Kijiji, sorry. In, uh, in, in the story today, sort of asking, you know, because everyone's like, okay, if you don't appoint Angelo, we get it. But then have a by-election. That yeah. really actually makes sense. You can't argue. But they didn't do that. They're, they're doing something completely different. Uh, so Lloyd Brown John says this, I don't understand the rationale. It makes no sense. I don't think anybody would have been upset if they appointed the person who came in second. Oh yeah, absolutely. And even re um, regarding the Toronto um, audition section, he says that that idea uh, borders on ludicrous. Ju I just don't see that you need to go through this ritualistic process. So he's a man of a strong opinion and does not like well, how I mean, City Council well, is kind of taking I, I, the I, I want a councillor who can juggle. I think, you know, maybe we're going to have a swimsuit competition. Oh, yeah, uh, there you, know, you go. These guys, I mean, Dilkins was yeah, already the city in the... City Council you know, Idol, right? <laughs> was, in, was, in the, uh, was in the new pool. Have a picture of that. So, yeah, I'm not sure how it's all going to go down. I mean, I suppose if... Uh, and Percy Hatfield, we, we, we really need to say this. Um, I kind of... We, we talked about him yesterday. Like, he created this mess. Yep. His political ambitions created a vacancy uh, in Ward 7. He had a solemn contract with voters in that ward that I'm going to serve you for four years until naked political ambition got in the way and he moved onwards and upwards to Queen's Park. So he has an obligation to sort of, you know, uh, take care of the mess he left behind, but he seems to be abrogating that because uh, he won't have an opinion on who, who it should be, whether it should be Angela, whether it should be a by-election. He won't say anything. All he will say uh, is that anybody who is appointed there shouldn't be able to run in the next election, which... It doesn't really make a lot of sense. Yeah, and I'm still, I was trying to wrap my head around that, what the rationale would be. So he's saying that he just wants someone to act as a placeholder, that it's not really fair for the people running for the next election because you already have a year up on them. But then what's the difference between that and then the incumbent anyway? That's what they were saying, that Percy was such a shoe in before because he was the incumbent, because of the name recognition. So I don't really understand the difference. I feel like you're actually at a disadvantage from the other candidates only haven't been in there for a year. Well, exactly. So, I mean, you have a by-election now, and, uh, you know, if the guy does okay and the, or girl, yeah. uh, if they do okay uh, in the next year, boom, they're going to get elected again. If they fall on their face, you know, it's just, it's just, yeah, a, exactly. just a trial run. And 100000 let's say, the cost of the election, these guys spend $100,000 on sandwiches for consultants, so $100,000 is not that much in the, in the grand scheme of things at, at what price democracy oh right? absolutely especially when they start floating out like well the aquatic center expenses that come up from that this idea for this tunnel going uh, to the riverfront it's a minor expense and for democracy like we have said like people have spent a lot more uh, in the name of it so exactly and just uh with percy we did tweet him yesterday like we told you and he didn't get back to us but no surprise because that twitter account was set up uh for the provincial election campaign and the last tweet was uh, actually a retweet uh, on August 1st of his victory celebration, so oh. maybe now that he's in office, he doesn't need 
Twitter anymore, but remember Percy, don't forget us little people uh, in Ward 7 and, and here in downtown Windsor. Exactly. All right, so a cute story that came out today. Uh, the Windsor Essex Humane Society posted about this. It's a little cat named Two Paws, uh, who, much as you would expect, uh, can get along by either walking on its two front legs or by dragging itself on its belly. Like, a sir, we're going to show you a video, like, it, it, should we show them the Yeah, video? we'll show you now. It kind of says the whole story, so check out Two Paws. All right, so that uh, was put out by Melanie Coulter, yeah. uh, the Humane Society, on their Facebook page. I think it's amazing, like a circus acrobat, like up on the front. Oh legs. no, it's impressive. Quite a feat, actually. Uh, so two paws. Uh, she had a severe genetic condition uh, that actually deformed her back legs, and she has an acutely infected uterus. Uh, so she actually had to go through uh, quite a bit of surgery at the Humane Society from one of the surgeons there. Uh, she's still on her way to recovery. She's at a foster home right now, but she will be up for adoption. Uh, but with all that surgery, it did come at a cost, so they are open to uh, donations. Uh, donations can be made online, in person, um, at, their, at the Humane Society at 1375 Provincial Road. No, I would step forward, but I have two cats at home already, so yeah. I can't. How about you, Dylan? You have, uh... I do have two cats as well, so you know, I would, but, uh, but it's an adorable cat, and I'm sure with Windsor, they have a heart of gold, so someone will definitely come forward. Okay. Uh, we're going to have more on that story later. We're going out uh, to meet uh, two paws and uh, right. you know talk, uh, have all the all the deets on that. And somebody you probably don't want to adopt. Uh, we're going to show you a picture, <laughs> uh, a, a picture right now. This is the guy uh, Windsor Police are looking for uh, in connection with the bank robbery uh, last week, uh, last, uh, last Friday, Friday. Yeah. last Friday, uh, the Scotia Bank in the thirteen Ottawa Street, thirteen hundred block of Ottawa Street. That's right. Uh, his name is uh, Dana Reardon. He's forty years old, of no fixed address. And uh, yeah, she's facing charges of robbery and breach of recognizance. Okay. So if any if you know any information, you recognize the guy, you know where he is, uh, call Windsor Police at 509-255-6700, extension 4830, or anonymously to Crime Stoppers at 509-258-TIPS. Okay, and now somebody you might want to adopt, okay? Uh, Windsor, we had a, uh, <laughs> you know, we had a lucky... What a good segue. There's, there's a good segue, okay. Uh, Windsor, man, now we apologize uh, if we get this name wrong. It's not, uh, we're not in radio. Uh, we spell it correctly, uh, but his name we think is uh, Randall Suzuki. Or Randall Shuki Suzuki. Uh, anyway, he's $100,000 richer after having won the crossword tripler jackpot. Exactly. His words were Aloha, Golf, Blizzard, uh, and Dale. Uh, and here's what he says. Uh, he bought the ticket. You know where he bought it? Uh, well, I do. Uh, Terry Corner Store on Pilette Road. Exactly. Not Lucky Lynn's uh, in Avery, no. but uh, on uh, Pilette Road there. And I guess he went out uh, in his van. He scratched the ticket uh, in his van. That's where he found out he won. And he rocked, uh, walked right back into the store, uh, you know, to say, "Hey, uh, I'm a big winner." And he must really love bowling because he likened the feeling to having bowled a perfect game. So I don't know. I feel like this would be a little more exciting, but you know what? It's something different for everyone. Yeah. No. Exactly. So 100,000. Of course, uh, we, we we showed you the the picture of him. The <laughs> OLG. They make you do that. It's like you know, if you want your hundred thousand dollars, you, you <laughs> exactly. know, exactly. You, you have to sort of post for the picture. And I'm glad they do that because Lotto Stories number one with a bullet. Oh yeah. Uh, on our website uh, all the time, people absolutely love Lotto winners. Yeah. We well, got to make sure that no one in your family is winning and not telling you. So we'll get that up as soon as we see it. Okay. Uh, thanks for stopping by. This has been the Winter Star News Cafe.